He's back. Hell yes, the Hound is back. Let's talk about episode 7 of Game of Thrones season 6, The Broken Man. At the beginning of this episode, we finally get the answer to the question that has been on many of our minds since it happened. What happened to Sandor Clegane? Well, he didn't die. He's been trying to atone for all of his crimes and we see him building some kind of a building amongst a bunch of people. I don't know if he's in the Riverlands. I'm not sure. One thing that I really liked about seeing him again was seeing how different he is now. We saw several scenes between him and a Septon named Ray, and he's just explaining what he went through and what he's done in his life. And it really makes Sandor Clodane really start and think on all that he's done and start to think that he might be deserving of forgiveness. It's just really exciting to see this because we've always seen the potential for good in him. All the times he saved Sansa and the time when he was holding Arya hostage. He he acted like her captor but eventually he started to treat her better and we just many times since the first season we see this potential for good in him and we really really see it in this and especially after the way his scenes in this episode ended that we are going to get that whole Clegane Bowl showdown at the end of the season hopefully I, I I think it's 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 pointing towards it it's pointing towards it and we really need it I need it I think it's going to be awesome to happen. It it seems like it's going to happen. What happens that I think is going to push him back towards King's Landing and helping the faith is that the Brotherhood Without Banners show up and they ask for help. And when Ray turns them away and says they don't have anything for them, when the Hound is off chopping wood, he comes back and yeah, the Brotherhood has killed everyone and hung Ray. It's not cool and I think the Hound is definitely going to be out for justice. Okay, so let's head to the North real quick. We see a really awesome scene where John and Tormund are trying to convince the wildlings to fight with them to take back Winterfell. The one thing that I think really helped them in their decision to help John was when Tormund pointed out, yo, he died for you. He literally died for you. And then they're all thinking and basically, yeah, they agree. They agree. And I love how one one comes up and he's like, snow. And just one word, but yeah. I love this. I really can't wait to see the look on Ramsey's face when John and his army show up and they have a giant in their army. Yeah. Even if they have a smaller army, it's gonna be like, yeah, we have a giant. Let's go. All right, so I'm gonna come back to the North in just a moment, but first, let's head on over to King's Landing and talk about everything that went down over there. One of the first things that we see over there in this episode is a scene between Marjorie and the High Sparrow, and if it wasn't clear before now, the High Sparrow is definitely in charge. There is no doubt in my mind. Marjorie is still trying to play the Game of Thrones and to weasel her way around the High Sparrow and all of his cronies and uh, yeah I don't know how well she is doing she's doing decent but she is always under constant watch the high sparrow basically warns Marjorie that Olana is about to get in trouble and then Marjorie has a meeting with her grandmother and tells her that she needs to get out of King's Landing and head back to Highgarden or yeah things are gonna get very bad now, before Elena heads back to Highgarden, we see a scene between her and Cersei where she really tears into Cersei and blames her for everything. Everything. And she reminds Cersei that she remembers the smirk on Cersei's face when her grandchildren were taken away. And she is not going to team up with Cersei. She is getting out of there. Now, when Elena walks out of the room, one thing that I really loved that gave me a little hope for Marjorie and her chances of survival she was able to get a message to her grandmother and it's not so much a note as it is a picture. It's a drawing of a rose. It's their house. Basically, I think it just means that she's still loyal to House Tyrell and she is not choosing the High Sparrow or Tommen over her family. She is just doing what she has to do to survive at this point. And if anyone can figure out how to free Loras, it's going to be Marjorie, and I think that's why she is not leaving King's Landing or anything like that. She wants to get her brother free and get away from the crazy, all of her family intact. I doubt that's what's going to happen, but you never know. I think it will kill her if Loras dies. I think it will drive her over the edge, and we will see a different Marjorie than we've ever seen before. It would be interesting to see a Marjorie without Loras, 
We've never seen that. I mean, we've seen her in different scenes without him, but it would be interesting to see how she reacts to his death. Okay, so let's head on over to River Run and talk about what happened over there in this episode. It was amazing. We got to see Jamie and Brom arrive at River Run and try to convince the Blackfish to surrender. Well, one of the first things that goes down are the Freys threaten to kill Lord Edmure if the Blackfish does not relinquish River Run, and he refuses. He outright refuses and tells them to kill him. And they chicken out. So I thought that was really funny. One of the things that I loved the most about the scene was when Jamie walked up with Brom and he took control of the entire siege and their prisoner and they were none too happy. They were pretty pissed and he didn't care. He took control and Jamie thinks that he'll have a better chance of convincing the Blackfish himself so he gets Brom to call a parlay and yeah, it didn't go well. It didn't go well at all. The Blackfish basically laughs in Jamie's face and tells him that he is very unimpressed with what he sees. I love the Blackfish. He is awesome, and I want this fight. I, I can't wait for this. Another thing that I really loved about this interaction between Jamie and the Blackfish was when he asked Jamie if he'd come to fulfill his promise and if he had Sansa and Arya or if he came to surrender himself back into their custody. That was really great that they touched on that. I just loved everything about this moment, especially because it was an interaction between the Blackfish and the Kingslayer. Names that they did not choose, but they have to bear. Now, let's head back north and talk about one of my favorite scenes this episode. It was really one of my favorite scenes. We see John, Sansa, and Ser Davos arrive at Bear Island at House Mormont and meet the Lady Lyanna Mormont. What did I love so much about this scene? Oh, there were many things, but one of the things that I loved the most was the fact that this is like a 10-year-old girl and she is a tough sell. When they are trying to convince her to join their cause, she at first refuses them. She outright refuses them and she's completely unimpressed with John, who knew her uncle, and with Sansa, and just everything. She's just done. She is not impressed and doesn't want anything to do with them. But then Sir Davos takes the lead, and he finds a way to relate to her, and she actually starts to lean towards their side again, and eventually she decides to help them. She only has 62 men to add to the army, but... They're Mormons, and Mormons are tough, so I cannot wait to see how this battle goes down. I really love how Sir Davos eventually took the lead in this and was able to get her to pledge her allegiance to House Stark. The next place that they stop is Deepwood Mott, and we see them speaking to Lord Glover, and when he finds out that wildlings make up the most of their army, he very quickly refuses them, and he makes sure to point out how his family was murdered by the Ironborn, and he considers House Stark dead. They then have to leave with absolutely nothing from House Glover, and they just, they don't have a lot of men. They still don't have enough men, and Sansa is not happy about it. She is not happy about it, but Jon says that if they want to have any hope of winning this war, they need to go to war now. The current stats of their army is as follows. They have 2,000 wildlings, 200 hornwoods, 143 mazers, and 62 mormons. That's not much. I don't know how they're going to win with that amount. Hopefully they get more. Now, hopefully, what Sansa is doing behind Jon's back in this episode, she keeps going behind his back. But hopefully what she does at the end of this scene helps them in some way. She sends a raven to someone. Someone. And signs it Sansa Stark. I don't know who she sent it to. I'm presuming that it is addressed to Lord Kerwin because Jon said they didn't have time to go and ask him for help. Or, or... She could be writing to Littlefinger because Littlefinger offered the Knights of the Vale to her. I don't know if she's going to go that route, but the fact that she's being secretive about this entire thing makes me think that she could be actually sending that letter to him. I could be wrong. It could be Lord Carwin. It could be Littlefinger. It could be the Blackfish, but she sent Brienne over there, so it's probably not. We'll just have to wait and see. 
All right, let's head across the Narrow Sea and talk about what happened over there in this episode. Now, one of the first things that we see are Yara and Theon in a whorehouse in Volantis. Yes, Theon has found himself in a whorehouse again. And I found myself sympathizing with him. I mean, who wouldn't? I felt so bad for him. And Yara started to feel bad as well. She's making out with this chick and then sends her away for a while and has another amazing tough love conversation with her brother. She tells her brother to drink his drink and if he doesn't want to live, if he can't become the Theon that he once was, if he can't find that part of himself again, to just cut his wrist and die. Because with the cowering mess that he is, he's not gonna be much help to Yara. And pretty quickly after that, we see a glimpse of the old Theon and yes, this is going to be good, especially because, wait for it, Yara revealed that she is taking Euron's idea. They are going to sail those ships to Marine and offer a pact to Daenerys, yes. Yes, yes, yes. This is what I wanted. I am so excited about this. To see more characters interacting with Daenerys, characters that we have seen in Westeros all this time, to see her interacting with them, and to see her finally make her way towards Westeros, and oh yes, this is going to be good. I am so happy that Yara took Euron's idea and is going to offer ships to Daenerys first. That is a relief. Okay, so the last thing that we see in this episode is a scene in Bravos. We see Arya book passage back to Westeros, and I get all excited, and I'm just like, yes, she's heading home. And I'm starting to wait for the other shoe to drop, and it does, in the form of the waif, in an old lady face, and stabbiness. She stabs Arya, and Arya jumps off a bridge into the water and gets out and is all bleeding all over the place, and I am kind of in shock at this point. I honestly could not react. I didn't know what to do with myself at this point. My jaw dropped, and I could hardly breathe, but it's Arya and I don't think they're going to kill her. I hope not, but I don't know because it's Game of Thrones. But considering she hasn't dropped dead, so I guess that was just the opening act to the big showdown between her and the Waif. I don't know if we're gonna get a huge showdown, but hopefully we do, fingers crossed. I wonder if Jacken will be watching, hmm. This episode was pretty good. It wasn't one of my favorites, but with all the things that happened in this episode, they have made me even more excited for the final episodes of the season. If you enjoyed this, please remember to comment, like, and subscribe, and I will talk to y'all later. Bye guys.